Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. How many of you ever seen the, uh, um, the cartoon Dogbert and Dilbert? You ever seen them? It's a, it's a cartoon like that comes in the, um, in the newspaper. Dogbert and Dilbert. There was one time that Dogbert had this and it said, I've, just started, I've, I've decided to start a discount religion. So here, here was his explanation of his discount religion. He said, I w- tithing would only be 5%, and then I would let people sin as much as they wanted. Now, during this exchange, Dilbert, he's sitting up in bed in, in the cartoon. He's reading a book, and through it all, he never says a word. And then finally, at the end, he gives his own conclusion. He says this. The only problem is that, is, the, the only problem is that I don't want to spend any time with anyone who would join that sort of religion. And what was he saying? There's a lot of people that only take a part of what the truth is. And how many of you know that a half-truth is basically what? A lie. There was an article that USA, did, USA Today did a, a while back, and it was called Many Beliefs, Many Beliefs, Many Paths to Heaven. And out of all these people that were surveyed, it said that most American religious believers, which is most of us, that they believe, including the Christians, most of the the Christians, they believe that eternal life is not exclusively for those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. In fact, 65% held an open view of what heaven's gates are. And 80% of this group said that they felt like Jews and Muslims and Hindus and atheists or people with no religion at all would also be saved. Well, you can believe whatever that you want, and it is true that there will be Jews and Hindus and Muslims and atheists that will be saved, but the only way they can be saved is they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life. Because Jesus said there is no way to the Father except through who? Me. So there will be Jews that will be saved, there will be Hindus, there will be Muslims, but they have to accept Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? But the, but the bottom line to all that is there are really nice people that have really messed up theology about what it means to truly sell out or to give up or to give everything that you have to the cause of Christ clearly we've got a lot of cafeteria Christians that go through the line and they kind of pick and choose what doctrines they're going to believe what doctrines suit them best in their lifestyle and when it comes to the religious cafeteria that they kind of walk through they'll say man I love that part of the Bible that says love the Lord your God I like that part but I'm going to skip that part about judgment and hell. Because that doesn't really, I don't want that. Or maybe the part about um, living with people that are difficult. I don't like that part either. Or the part that talks about where Paul says, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross every single day. An imitation of what the true, real thing is. See, the book of James talks about this, what we're talking about, discount religion that I'm talking about today. And this is what he says. He says, talking a good game isn't enough. It's what you do that matters. It's what you do that matters. Talking about helping the people that have been ravaged by Hurricane Harvey is not enough. Helping hands, doing whatever that you can is what we're talking about. James 2 In the second chapter of James, which is kind of where I'm going to be today, he talks about a subtle form of discrimination that shows sometimes how we treat people that aren't just like us. He talks about people that don't look like us. Look at somebody and sit beside you and say, I'm glad you don't look like us. So, no. But they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. Maybe they have different backgrounds than us. Maybe they're in a different social class than we are. Maybe they speak another language. Maybe that... They're immigrants, or maybe they're refugees from another country. Maybe they're widows, or just orphans. Maybe they're prisoners, or drug addicts, or they just may look shabby, or they just may smell funny. But we're called to love them anyway. 
We're called to love them anyway. And if we're going to discount what we have as Christians and have some kind of a discount religion in the favor of genuine Christianity, we have got to discover these three things this morning. And they're very simple. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about one of them that I'm going to be using this morning is mercy. But the first one I'm going to talk about this morning is that we need more love. We need more love. I think the Beatles said it really good when they said, love is all you need. Love is all you need. James, James 2, 8 and 9. If you have your Bible, you can turn to it. And we'll stay right in that area. James chapter 2. Go to Hebrews and take a right if you don't know where it is. James 2, 9, 8 and 9 says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, let me read that again. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as what? Yourself. yourself. Then you're doing what? I love that. You're doing right. But if you show favoritism and you sin, you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now, what does he mean in, when he talks about the royal law? If you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. He's telling us that this command that, that he's saying in this chapter comes with a divine authority. He's quoting Leviticus 19, 18, and reminds us to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not just good advice, that it's a command from the king. Loving your neighbor as yourself is not just a good idea. It's a command from the king. You know, recently, especially during the election last fall, we had a lot of dialogue talking about what, what the era was that we were in, that we were in the post-Christian era. And, and in many ways, a lot of the things that we heard in the election, as we were going through all the election, were anti-Christian. I mean, a lot of the things that were talked about and debated were completely against what we believe as Christian people. But let me tell you this. No matter what may happen in the political realm, we're still called to love our neighbor. We're still called to love those that are unfortunate and love those that maybe don't look like us and don't smell like us and don't act like us. See, the good news is we do not need the Supreme Court decision to do that. Can you say amen? We don't need the Supreme Court to develop a love your neighbor law. What we're talking about this morning is completely out of the realm of what politics would ever bring to the table. We're talking about loving the widows and the orphans and the poor. You see, no law of man can force us to love them. And the great thing is that no law of man can keep us from loving them. No matter which side of that you're on. When he says love your neighbor, it doesn't matter if you were made to do it or not made to do it. The law can't force you to do it, nor can it keep you from doing it. So this is what he's talking about when he talks about the royal law of loving, loving your neighbor. It cannot be overturned. Verse 9 of James it talks about favoritism. He talks about, in the Greek he's talking about, Favoring someone in regard to their face or judging them as a different face than mine. In one of the debates of, in the, politi in the uh, presidential election last year, I heard one of the, um, the presidential candidates said, look at that face. Would anybody vote for that face? <laughs> Scott said, yep. <laughs> but here's the bottom line. If you don't know what else to do in your life, Love your neighbor. If nothing else about what we do as Christians means anything to you, the one thing you can do is love your neighbor and be kind to somebody. Can you say amen? amen. Say amen louder. Amen. Yes. Yesterday, um, Pastor Greg and Bobby, they took a bunch of teenagers to the, the county fair. And we're going to be showing you some pictures of the stuff that they did. And they made sandwiches and they took water and they gave them to the carnival workers that were at the Cumberland County Fair yesterday. And they spent a couple of hours, and, and that's like Greg said. He said, if we have an opportunity to minister Jesus to them, we'll minister Jesus to them. But if we don't have an opportunity to minister Jesus, we're going to give them a, a thing of cold water and a bologna sandwich. It's loving your neighbor. It's finding someone that's in need. And not only did some of your kids, after they gave them the bologna sandwich and the water, they got to ride free. So that was even better. So what does it mean? So what does it mean when I, when I said, if you don't know what else to do, love your neighbor? Does that mean that you love the person that lives next to you? Yes. 
I've told you about the guy that, that lives next to us. Uh, I, I, it's, I, I went to his house when we first moved in. And I went and knocked on his door. And he didn't come. And I knocked on his door again. And he didn't come. So, you know, you know that, that awkward time when you, you're like, what if he's in the bathroom or something? But you don't, and you don't know whether to come back again or knock again. So I was like, okay, last one. And then I was like, he still didn't come. So I went to walk and I got walking back. All of a sudden he comes to the door. He goes, hey. I went, hey. He said, hey, I'm Wesley Pritchard. We just moved in next door to you. I said, uh, uh, I pastor the church right down the road. And I just want to tell you, you know, if, you, if you ever need a cup of sugar or anything like that, you know, we're right next door and we're just thrilled to be here. Nobody lived in this house that we're living in for a long time. I said, so if anything you need, man, just let us know. All right. Yeah. And he's looking at me like. And then I said, okay, see you later. I went and walked back. He goes, hey. Yeah. He said, I'm a loner. I like to be left alone. <laughs> okay. So I went walking back again. Then I was like, well, I just want to tell you. I pastor a church right down the road here of about 650, 700 people. And I have uh, two kids and five grandkids, and we are the loudest people you've ever met in your entire life. So have a good day. See you later. <laughs> then he turned white and fainted right there on his front porch. <laughs> but you never know when you're going to meet a neighbor. It may be in your geometry class, or it may be somebody that's immigrating from Somalia or Vander. <laughs> or it may be... It may be the postal worker that delivers your mail. Or it may, be, it may be your hairdresser. Or it may be somebody who's really, really sick and just needs your prayers. It may be a basketball coach. It may be somebody that sits on the plane next to you that never stops talking. Aaron Woburn said he was on a plane one time and there was a lady beside of him. And he said as the plane kept going, he said the farther her head came over to his shoulder... And he said, then she started drooling on the side of his shoulder. He said, now, I'm not saying this woman was ugly. He said, but she was just barely pretty. <laughs> but you might. How many of you know some people like that? Amen. No, that, that drool is what I was talking about. No. But the list never ends. It could be a friend from your college days. It could be a widow. That lives by themselves. You see, the list never ends. The list never ends on what we can call our neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? Exactly. Who said that? Mr. Rogers. You think, oh, I think Jesus said it somewhere in here. <laughs> no, it was Mr. Rogers. What does it start? How can, you, how can you do it? How can you be a neighbor to somebody? Let me tell you what it starts with. Kindness. It starts with greeting them. It starts with just talking to them, just welcoming to your church, welcoming somebody that you've never seen that walks in the door that may sit on the same pew as you, looking at them and saying, man, I'm glad to see you here this morning. Please sit with me and my family. Shake their hand. Introduce yourself to them. It's being a neighbor. Just being a neighbor. It means getting to know them. Then it might mean driving them to the hospital. Or maybe just sending them an email to encourage them or a text. I've missed you. Where have you been? It means maybe giving them some kind of physical aid. Maybe it means putting gas in their car sometime. It may cost you time that you'd rather spend somewhere else. But it means broadening your circle of friends. None of it's easy. Because all of us are only one person. There's, there's only so much that we can do. Every one of us in this place don't have more than 168 hours in a week. We're all defined from A to B on how many hours and how many minutes that are in a day. And all of us, every one of us in here, our time's limited. Our energy's limited. Our resources are limited. And we can't get equally involved in every situation but there's no excuse for not getting involved at all. You can't be everything to everyone. But you can be something to someone. You can't be everything to everyone. 
that you can truly be something to someone. Love your neighbors, even when it hurts. That's what the royal law that James is talking about in that verse is. I, I found these words, and they, I, they, they say that these words came from the Quakers. It says, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. You got one shot to make a difference. One shot. One shot. If you look at church growth and you, you look at all the different things about how to grow your church, you know what the top of the list is? Good morning. We're glad to see you. Somebody making them feel welcome. Somebody making them feel like that they make a difference. Don't defer or neglect it, for you may never ever have, ever have an opportunity to do it again. So you want to please the Lord this week? Ask, ask Him to help you love your neighbor. Pray that you'll find somebody who is a neighbor. That you'll be able to reach out to them. That you'll love him. And I promise you, you'll love yourself a bunch more. It makes such a difference in your own life when you reach out to someone that's less fortunate than you. There's just something about helping somebody. Something about helping somebody. Number two, love first. Honesty. Honesty. James 2, 10, 11 says this. He says, whoever keeps the whole, y'all and let stu- the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said... Don't commit adultery, also said don't commit murder. If you commit adultery, but do if you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. So what's the biggest challenge that you face in your life? There's a guy that was a, in charge of a worldwide ministry, and he was in, he was in doing a, um, an interview, and, and the interviewer asked him, said, "What would be the most difficult thing that you have to deal with?" The interviewer said, would it be dealing with people? Or would it be trying to raise money for, your, for every, all the things that you do? Or is, it, is the hardest thing you do figuring out how to make the decisions for your ministry to go on and for the business of your ministry to go on? And this is the way he answered. He said, my greatest challenge is always the man in the mirror. My greatest challenge is always the man in the mirror. Because if I can keep him straight, then the rest of my job is not so hard. What did Michael Jackson say? I'm starting with the man in the mirror. That's it. I'm asking him to change his ways. That's it. I can't moonwalk. You can forget that. <clears throat> that strikes me the honest answer, and it's kind of along the lines of this answer. We, are, we have met the enemy. And the enemy is us. We've met the enemy, and most of the time the enemy's us. Because it's always easier to make excuses or to pass the buck or to blame others. In this, James, in this case, James wants us to face our own tendency to excuse sin. And some of you may say this morning, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a terrible sinner. I could be a lot worse, and absolutely, it could be, uh, all of us could be worse. I mean, if we went down the list of the Ten Commandments, say, well, I I got, I ain't done that one today. I I ain't done that one today either. You keep going down the list. But the Bible says to break any part of God's law is the same thing as breaking all of it. It's not talking about just the Ten Commandments. It's everything that we do. In James 10, he said, whoever keeps the whole, whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. It's like it, the Ten Commandments are like a chain link fence. And, and that if you break a part of it, it weakens everything else around it. Because you can't substitute one thing for another. You, you can't go into your day and say, well, I hadn't killed anybody today, but I did rob a bank. It just don't work. You see, obedience in one area cannot make up for disobedience in another area. Obedience in one area can't make up for disobedience in, the, in another area. Maybe you did keep all of the commandments one day. But 
you talk nasty to somebody that just needed a helping hand. There's no such thing as being a moderate sinner. It's like being a little bit pregnant. It ain't it, is it? Amen, ladies? I love what Eva May Lefebvre said on one of the videos that we did years ago. They were asking her how old she was. And she, at this point, I think she was 95 years old. And Bill Gaither asked her, he said, he said Eva May, he said, um, you don't mind telling your age? And she said, oh, no, sir. She said, it's kind of like being pregnant. They're going to find out sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> but James was saying, either you are or you're not. You can't, you, can't, you can't make up for the things that you're doing in your life that are wrong just by trying to do all of these other things right on this side. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be across the board. And the first thing that you have to be honest with is number one. You've got to be honest with yourself, Gary. We need more honesty about what our true condition is. The most difficult thing is that person that's in the what? In the mirror. If we were honest, we wouldn't make as many excuses in our lives. It would be way more pleasing to the Lord. If we were just honest, not with the person that's sitting beside of us, with ourselves. Okay, number three. Mercy. <clears throat> Let me introduce you to this friend called Grace. Doesn't care about your past or your many mistakes. He'll cover your sin in a warm embrace. Let me introduce you this morning to a friend called Grace. James 2, 12, and 13 says this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives them freedom. Because judgment, look at this. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Say that with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Ah, I love that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy. James uses a term, three different terms for the law in this passage. In verse 8, he talks about the royal law, and it points to the source of the law. In verse 10, the whole law is talking about the extent of the law. And then in verse 12, he talks about the law that gives freedom. That points to what the aim of the law is. Now look at that again. The royal law is the source. The whole law is the extent. And the law that gives freedom. That points to the aim of where the law is. When the king tells us to love our neighbor, then we can't make excuses and hide behind partial obedience. You get that? When the king comes with this royal law and he points it to us and tells us to love our neighbor, we can't hide behind a part of it. But when we obey, then he shows us mercy and that mercy says that it will be with us and deliver us until the day of judgment. Somebody says, well, wait a minute, I thought we were judged when we trusted Christ. That's true. But the Bible says that we're all going to stand and we're all going to be judged before the seat of Christ. And that's where we're going to be evaluated and we're going to be asked a question. What did you do with the gifts and the talents that I gave you and what did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with him? So, if we want mercy on that day then we got to show mercy today. If anybody, if, if you have a, tr a, a problem with this, you, you need to read, you need to go back and go to Matthew 18, 20, uh, 21 through 35, where he talks to his disciples. And it's a story of, of and I've, I've used this story before, about the man that came and was forgiven of this massive debt that he had. And Jesus was saying, he was forgiven of this massive debt, but what did he do? He turned back around to the guy that, that didn't owe anything, basically. And he made him pay back everything that he owed him. And Jesus was talking about the unforgiveness that the man who had the great debt had toward the man that had the little debt. You know, unforgiveness in our world should never surprise us because people are going to get angry. People are going to hold grudges. People are going to be for years in a cage called bitterness. But the shock of this parable between these two men is the man that was forgiven first, his debt was enormous. It, in, the, in, today's word, it was, in, in today's world, it was millions and millions of dollars. And what the other guy owed was just hundreds. You see, a lot of us are kind of like the unforgiven servant. We were going to stand one day before the Almighty God. 
with our sins and the things that we've done with our life piled up like a great old big mountain. He's going to look at you and he's going to say, what? What? Because see, our sin that we had on us was like a $500 million debt that we could never pay in a lifetime. And we come to God with the same thing. We say, I can't pay. And then he says this, I forgive all your sins. My son has paid the debt and you owe me nothing. Then what do we do? We get up from the pew, we walk away from the communion table, we get up from the altar and we walk outside and we see somebody that has offended us and we say, pay me right now. No wonder in our lives that we're tormented. No wonder that we have so much anger. No wonder that we're bitter. No wonder we have problems. No wonder we have friendships that won't last. No wonder that we can't get along. We've never learned the secret of unlimited forgiveness. You say, I just want justice. Fine. You'll get it, but you'll regret it. Because James said, the unmerciful person will receive judgment without mercy. The Phillips translation says this. It says, the man who makes no allowances for others will find none made for him. The man who makes no allowances for others will find none made for him. In the same manner that you judge You're going to be judged. If you want the Lord to show mercy to me, then I'm going to show mercy to others. Judge in the same manner. Mercy. Lord, have mercy. If I want want the Lord to show mercy to me, then I've got to show mercy to others. We could really say it like this. Because God has shown amazing mercy to me in Christ, I will show some amazing mercy to others so that mercy will be shown to me in the last days when I stand before the Lord. Because God has shown amazing mercy to me in Christ, then I'll show amazing mercy to others so mercy will be shown to me when I stand before the Lord. Mercy triumphs over judgment every time I show the mercy of God to others. Can you say amen? Mercy triumphs over judgment every time. How many times? Every time that I show mercy to others. I call this message discount religion, and I kind of got the idea from that Dilbert cartoon that I was talking about. Because a lot of times we discount what we've truly been given. We discount the mercy and the grace that we've been given. Sometimes it just involves doctrines that are unpopular. And sometimes it involves what the nitty-gritty demands of the Lord Jesus are. And we just want to discount that. But if we want to practice genuine Christianity, I'm going to give them to you one more time. We need more love, we need more honesty, and we need more mercy. Can you say amen? Amen. So So the question that I want to ask you this morning goes something like this. I wrote this down so I could remember how to say this. So realizing our own background and our culture and our heritage and understanding that we have our own preference about how things ought to be done, are we willing to submit those things to the Lord so that we might be set free from sin and favoritism? That's a long question. But are we willing to submit those things to the Lord that we can be set free? Because whatever we judge and whatever area that we judge in or whatever measure that we judge in, we're going to be judged the same way. So what do you do? You submit ourselves to the Lord and to His Word. If we won't, then the Bible says that we've sinned against those who are different from us. And if we've sinned against them, we've sinned against the Lord. And He has never shown you any favoritism at all. If we show mercy as mercy has been shown to us, then we will receive mercy. Somebody say amen. That is the promise of God. More love, more honesty, more mercy. And if not, you're going to get justice, but you ain't going to be happy about it. But if we've learned anything through grace and mercy, it's the grace and the kindness of our Lord Jesus. Through the grace and the kindness of our Lord Jesus and the mercy that he has, judgment can be disarmed. Judgment can be disarmed. Blessed, say this with me. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy.
mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Did you get anything out of that this morning? I want to do two things. I want to let you stay in your seat. I'm going to do a couple things. We're going to go. Um, Ruth Vandeveer, are you here this morning? Come up here, Ruth. I want to say this, too, while, while Ruth is coming. A, a lot of you guys knew Linda Fry. Linda Fry was a member of our church for a few years. Linda passed away this week, and her service is going to be this afternoon. But um, any of you that knew Linda, um, we can get um, information about where she's going to be this afternoon. But it, it, it was your, is your grandson? And he's having, yeah, yeah, Viv, come stand with her. He's having seizures, but it's the seizures that he's having are stopping his heart. And we want to pray for him this morning. And then I want to pray for another young lady, Lindsay Taylor. Come here, honey. Lee, you and Teresa, come. I want you to lay hands on her. Stand right here, sweetheart. Lindsay is, she goes to Catawba, and Lindsay came out of high school and went there to play softball. Great softball player. Softball has been a huge part of her life and her parents' life all the way growing up. Hey, hey, um, Shane here? Shane here with you? Oh, then come down here, Kelly. Come stand with your daughter. But Lindsay has, she has had um, concussions, um, and she's had concussions playing softball, running, hitting the ground. All the different things that come with being an athlete. She's had concussions, and now she's under concussion protocol. Um, she can't play anymore. Basically, the part of her life that was softball, she can't play anymore because the doctors have told her she can't do it anymore, which is okay. I mean, it comes to a point in your life where even, even strong, experienced athletes like myself have to know <laughs> when, you just, when you just have to stop. How many of you men can say amen? But you still got it, don't you, boys? Yeah. yeah. But for this kid, it's been a huge part of her life. And she's okay with laying down that part of her life. But now it's affecting other areas of her life. She's having headaches. She can't concentrate. She can't see. And so we're going to ask the Lord to heal her this morning and touch her. We're going to believe that. We're going to believe for your grandson. And we're going to believe for her. So I'm just going to ask you if you'll stand and stretch both your hands. And we're going to pray for them this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you so much this morning for sending your son Jesus to us. And we thank you for all the things that King Jesus is to us. But this morning, we call on him as our healer. Jesus, I want to thank you today for taking stripes on your back for our healing. You've promised us in 1 Peter 2, 24, that by your stripes we are healed. So, Lord, I come to you today for these two kids, for, for Ruth's grandson, Shane, and I come to you for Lindsay. We speak to all of the symptoms and everything that's going on in their life, Lord, and we just ask you to touch them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that the doctors know facts and the doctors know all of the things, but, Lord, we thank you that you're the great physician. So we ask you, Lord, in every test and everything that they're going through to try to figure out what the problem is, that you would lead the doctors, you would lead the nurses, that you would have all the tests to come back, Lord, so they can find out exactly what's going on. But Jesus, we lean on you right now as a great physician, and we ask you to touch them in Jesus' name. Would you say this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, touch them in your name. Now, I just I want you to raise up your hands and thank him. Say, Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for touching them. I thank you for coming right now to where they are and touching them and make a difference in their life. Lord, we believe for a good report in Jesus' name. And Father, for everyone that's in the house this morning with their hands raised this morning, Lord, I thank you that we choose love and we choose mercy and we choose honesty in this place today. Lord, we thank you that for the word that has come forth this morning, Lord, and we thank you for the word that is sharp and as powerful as a two-edged sword. So we come to you right now, Lord, and we just ask you to allow this word to be hidden in our hearts that will never be the same in Jesus' name. Will never be the same in Jesus' name. So, Father, bless everyone that's under the sound of my voice, whether it's in this house or whether it's on the Internet or wherever it is. And I just ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would make a difference through the love and the honesty and the mercy that every one of us will have. In Jesus' name, say, say this with me. Say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name let, it let it be done in my life.